All right, my name is Griffin Stockford. Um, I am here with 17-year-old um, musher Caleb Hayes and his father, Jonathan Nathaniel Hayes. Um, they were training uh, for Sled Dog Race, the Can-Am International in Fort Kent, Maine on Tuesday, March 2nd, 2022. And uh, around 8 p.m. they came back. Jonathan was leading Caleb on a snowmobile, uh, Caleb and his team on a snowmobile. And when they got back, uh, Jonathan saw fresh moose tracks about 300 yards out from the kennel. Um, and uh, if one of you guys wants to take it from there. Yeah, I, I stopped and I warned Caleb uh, because these moose prints weren't there when we had gone out a couple hours hours earlier and they were heading toward the kennel. So I told him to be careful as we entered into the kennel that there might be a, a moose. And this, uh, we had a moose in the dog yard just three days earlier that had destroyed some of our property. And uh, our female lead dog had chased it off and I had to go catch her and bring her back. So um, we were we were concerned that it was the same moose back again and it was. And Caleb, you, um, your father was in front of you. You, uh, he warned you about the moose and, and, and when you got to the kennel and you saw the moose in action, uh, what was the first thing that crossed your mind? I've got to hold them here till my dad gets here because I don't want our dogs getting in any danger. I want them to stay safe because, you know, I got like a race in like four days and, you know, like I just got to, I got to hold them right here because this is probably as far as I can get from this thing because if I get any closer, it will go on a rampage and hurt every one of our dogs and I can't have that. So, and after the fact, um, Jonathan, you you had a lot of praise for Caleb uh, as a musher. Can you explain what Caleb did that that was right in that situation? Yeah, um, you know, it uh, the 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 dogs ended up after about ten minutes overpowering Caleb and starting to drag him toward the moose. The moose was um, the moose was already attacking the puppies in the dog yard and stomping dog houses and puppies and kicking and uh when the team started pulling caleb toward the dog uh, toward the moose the moose turned its attention to the team and charged the mo the team several times stomping through the team um caleb uh his his first instinct was to care for his team so even when he was holding the gang line and was being drugged to the moose he wasn't letting go of his team because he wanted to ensure their safety and, um, you know, any musher will tell you, and, and there does come a time when, you know, it is important for the musher to take care of themselves, <laughs> but, um, any musher will tell you that your, your first duty is to your team to take care of your dogs, because, uh, if you don't take care of them, they can't take care of you. And so his natural instinct was protect my team, protect my dogs. And I was really proud of him for that. And can one of you guys kind of des describe what the moose was like? Was it was it was its eyes bugging out? Was it did it was it panicking? What was the state of the moose when you first came across it? I'll start, and then he he can dive in because uh, when I got to the dog yard, as he said, he had already stopped the team, so I tried to maneuver the snowmobile between the team and the moose so that the moose wouldn't attack our team. Um, but the snowmobile just enraged the moose more and the moose came over my snowmobile and I'm scrambling to get back. And, uh, you know, you don't realize how really how big they are. Um, and you, I never knew that moose growled uh, until this moment where I'm laying on the ground behind my snowmobile and she's standing on the other side of the snowmobile looking down at me with her ears pinned back with this low growl uh, coming out of her. And I'm like, OK, this is this is pretty scary. Um and uh, so, you know, we held it like that for a little while. And then Caleb got the most close up view because the dogs drug him halfway to the moose. And then the moose came up and down the team and went right over Caleb. Um, I was yelling at him and I told him to get out of there. But then when he let go, by this time, his foot had gotten tangled in the gang line. And so it was he was having trouble getting out when the moose crossed over him. So I, I'll let him tell uh, what the moose looked like from there. Yep. Um, so uh, it was it was enraged as soon as you know, like the dogs pulled the ice hook because I was on I was on the sled and I thought I had it secure because I had stomped it in more than once, 
And um, when they pulled it, I was as surprised as I could be because that thing was in some major ice and they showed some power. I hope they show in the race, but because <laughs> um, when they went at that thing, they probably pulled me halfway through, if not more, through the dog yard. And, and it, that enraged the moose and it, it kind of just went left and right and then it charged us and um, I had to go up to pull the team back because after I got the ice hook secured, I had to try to unhook the tug lines, which is the back of um, the dog to get them to pull um, the sled efficiently. So I was, um, uh, so I was doing that and my foot got tangled in it and I hadn't noticed until the moose came right over me. And um, <laughs> so I tried, I tried to, uh, so I slipped and um, it, it went right over me. It was, it was massive. Like it was probably even bigger from that view because um, yeah. So when it that went, Go ahead. Sorry. That was another thing that he did that was just really great instinctually. Once he could no longer hold the, these guys have been training for the Can-Am crown all winter. So they're stocked and beefed up. They're pumped and ready for this. So they're really muscular right now. And um, when he could no longer hold them back, he knew that he needed to go up and release the tug lines on the dogs so that they were still connected to the sled, but they couldn't pull the sled as efficiently um, so, again, it was just really great thinking on his part. Caleb, do you think the moose even knew you were there in the middle of all the dogs? Or do you think the moose was just kind of in a blind uh, rage or whatever you want to call it? Um, I, I don't know. Because uh, um, my dad pointed out a few times that it, it probably didn't know the difference between uh, a wolf pack and a sled dog team because um, it just charged and I don't know if it saw me or not but all I know is that it it charged like at like a five minute cycle like every five minutes it would come in and attack and I'm not sure if it saw any of us but it it definitely saw something so I don't know and on the five minute cycle thing so it, it would stomp kick then it would it would sort of go away and do and do what before it came back it would just kind of breathe or, or what yeah it was it was uh going to the far end of the kennel um kind of catching its breath you know just looking over things and then it would just get annoyed again by the puppies and go kicking at the puppies or it would get annoyed by this you know pack of wolves our dog sled team you know growling and barking trying to get to it and it would come and it would stomp on the dog sled team it really is a miracle that none of our dogs uh, there's no superficial injuries we've been looking and watching you know to see if there's internal injuries that we've been missing uh, we haven't seen any sign of that either but of course today it is the mandatory uh, vet check for the can-am and we're going to have the vets you know look over them thoroughly today to make sure that they're ready to go and the dogs that weren't um Part of the team that Caleb was was uh, practicing with, it was primarily puppies in the kennel. Right. Yeah, the puppies aren't old enough yet to, to be on the team. They're about four and a half months. And so at a certain point, the decision was made to send Caleb back to get a gun. Um, what went into that decision-making process um, and... Um, how many minutes had passed? How much of the attack had occurred before you guys' yeah. idea came to you? How'd that all work? By this time, it, like, it had been probably 15 or 20 minutes, and it was apparent that this, this moose wasn't going anywhere. Um, you know, we were giving her plenty, ample time to, to leave. Uh, she wasn't going anywhere. This was her second time at our kennel. She had destroyed stuff the first time she was there, and um, n not only was she not leaving, but as you know, as Caleb was saying, every five minutes or so, she would just get annoyed and come stomping dogs. And, uh, you know, th there's a lot that could be contributing to that. Um, snow is really deep right now, and it's covered with about an inch of ice in, in the woods up here. 
and uh, moose don't want to move around in that and they definitely don't want to be in deep snow crusted with ice if they're trying to get away from a wolf pack so it makes sense that she wanted to stand her ground on the hard pack ground so that she can move around the only other thing that we could think is that perhaps um, it's the straw bedding that we use in our dog houses if she's extremely hungry maybe she figured it was worth the risk to come into our dog yard routinely and steal straw um, so I, I just because of all of that uh, and and you know the repeated attacks and she's not leaving we couldn't even unhitch our dogs and put them away because every, we, we were having to keep an eye on her and she kept coming in so I told him uh, you know it's a mile ride uh, out from our kennel um, to the road I said go down there see if someone's got a gun. We used to carry guns. Um, I used to be pretty um, diligent in uh, making sure I had a firearm with me. But after 20 plus years of mushing and never needing it, I got lax in the practice and uh, regretted that for sure. Um, so he went down um, and a neighbor lent him a new uh, muzzle loader that had never been shot, had um, all of the, you know, the the powder, the primer, the cap, all that stuff uh, in a bag, you know, like a Walmart bag, and sent that up with him too. And it's, it's a snowstorm in the middle of the night, and I've got a raging moose, and I've never shot a muzzle loader before, and I knew there's no way I was going to properly load that thing. <laughs> so so I had to send him back down for another one. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, and then again, you know, he's, you know, that that's a total of four miles on a, on a snowmobile, you know, going to – neighbor's houses asking you know this random teenager showing up on your doorstep in the middle of the night you know at in a snowstorm asking for a rifle i mean <laughs> i'm sure it was pretty odd for for the neighbors yeah caleb what was that like for you uh oh. it, it's, some, it's something out of a movie honestly um so how, how was that when you when you get to the neighbor's house your adrenaline must be pumping um talk about that a little bit um well, I, um, I, the whole time I was on that snowmobile, I tried to go as fast as I could, and that was like <laughs> the as as far as that throttle would go down on that handle on that snowmobile, I would push it down, and I would I would make sure that it go as fast as it could because I knew that my dad and my sled dog team were in danger and I had to get a gun fast and it was really really awkward going up to people asking um I didn't I didn't, <laughs> I didn't ask um uh like do you have a gun I can use because my dog team is getting attacked I said sir do you have a firearm and they were just all like they were like I'm pretty sure one person lied to me because <laughs> it seemed like <laughs> seriously you went to three houses yeah so the first First person I went to, um, I was like, "Sir, do you have a firearm?" They said no, and uh, I took off running. And he and he asked, and he because you know like I don't want to stick around if he doesn't have anything. I need to get a gun fast. So he said, he said no, and as soon as I took off running, he said, "Why?" I didn't answer him because I knew that would take up time. So I went to the next house, and I was like, "Sir, do you have a firearm?" He's like, "Nope." And I took off running because, <laughs> again, I didn't want to waste any time. So, and then he was like, I have a muzzle loader. And I, I stopped. I, like, I, like, skid my feet. And I was like, I was like, what is that? And <laughs> so, and then he's like, it's a gun. And I was like, that, in my head, I was thinking, that doesn't sound like a gun. So, um, I went back and I was like, well, if it's a gun, I got to grab it. So, I grabbed it and I got it on the snowmobile after having like a five minute awkward conversation that took up too much time, I got on my snowmobile and I took off as fast as I could up the hill. And I, <laughs> and you know, that was just the first time. And after I found out my dad couldn't use a muzzle loader because you know, it, it, I know what a muzzle loader is like. I'd never loaded one myself, but it takes like forever to load. And we didn't have that time, you know, um, probably, since we didn't know how to use it, would have been faster just to grab another one, which we did because it's in the middle of a snowstorm and at night. So I had to get back on my snowmobile and I had to go <laughs> right back down the mountain. And um, I went to Megan's house, um, a friend of ours, 
and she handed me a thirty out six and a magazine. And um, so actually, when I got down to the mountain, I had to get in our car and I had to back up and I had to speed down. I'm glad there was no police there because he would have. He doesn't have driver's license. No, I don't. <laughs> so I got to Megan's house. I got the thirty out six and the magazine. Put it in my uh uh the passenger seat the, the yeah passenger seat and I drove back and I didn't know how to turn the lights off or on so I was scrambling for a couple minutes and the snowmobile um since it's like 1980s snowmobile I had to grab it like and I had to move it over because it doesn't have reverse it doesn't have reverse and <laughs> that took forever and you know after I found the magazine and the gun, I posted it up like this, and I held it with one hand, and that was probably the roughest ride I had on that thing, because I couldn't control it, and it almost spun out of control, but I got to dad, and I was like, this this chaos is ending, so that's pretty much what that was like. So. And and I'll, I'll say, like, um, I was a Marine infantryman. His older brother is currently a Marine infantryman. We know how to use rifles. I've, I taught him how to shoot the way the Marine Corps taught me to, how to shoot. Um, so we're familiar with guns, just we're completely ignorant of muzzle loaders. So that, that, <laughs> was, that was a bad turn. And of course, all this time, the moose is, is attacking us, um, attacking the dogs. And, and you were doing what, Jonathan? Just monitoring and, and trying to wait? And No, the whole time he was gone, I had both of my arms wrapped in the gang lines of and it was a total of like 30 minutes is two 10 to 15 minute runs down there. I had both of my arms wrapped in the gang lines, holding eight dogs back um, while he was gone. I weigh about a hundred pounds more than he does. So uh, I'm, I'm a better ballast uh, to weigh. The, I'm a better anchor to weigh the dogs down and uh, he he's younger and faster. So uh, it was, it just made sense that I hold his team while he goes and gets the rifle. And then when you get back with the with the gun, Caleb, um, what happens from there? Um, I, I'll, I'll tell. I was I was kind of I was I was kind of be you know when your adrenaline's running. I was being really barky and snappy and giving him orders. And so not only did he have this moose breathing down his neck, but he had me breathing down his neck. <laughs> and uh, and I realized that you know um, that this was. I was contributing to this being a traumatic situation for him. So he gave me the rifle and the bullets and I, I, I put, I put the magazine in and I chambered around and my brain, you know, just start, I started thinking about him and this experience for him. And I was like, you know what, how would you like to shoot your first moose? And he lit up like a Christmas tree. He said, yes, sir. So I, that's when I handed the rifle to him. Yep. Yeah. So tell him about that. Tell him about this. Oh, okay. So the first shot, um, I was too excited to put this thing down because, you know, what was running through my mind was like, you know, that thing almost killed me, killed the dogs, you know, probably, I mean, I wasn't up there because, you know, I was on the snowmobile and I was like, I don't know how many <laughs> times it attacked my dead. Like this has got to end. So I was <laughs> so excited. And so I put the rifle up. And I, I went through hunter safety course, and I got my lifetime hunting and fishing <laughs> license in a raffle. Uh, so I had to get the uh, safety course done. So I got that done, and I forgot about everything. And um, I, just, I put the scope too close to my eye, and it gave me that right there in my nose. <laughs> so um, it popped me, and at that moment, I was hit with everything I learned and dumbness and more because because <laughs> um uh i took the second shot knowing that i would do it right and because i breathed in and as i breathed out slowly i slowly pulled the trigger and i shot it so the first time i shot it it was uh kind of just shot it and it stumbled and it got right back up the second time put it down so and so then the moose was was laying. Sounds like uh, you did you guys you guys probably were you sure you didn't know if it was dead or not at that time. You just knew that it was was down. Yeah. 
I appreciate you asking this question because there's been a lot of armchair quarterbacking, uh, Monday morning quarterbacking from people uh, online since this happened. Um, the rifle we were loaned, we were only given a few rounds and we did not have any bullets to, um, to terminate the moose after it was down. We hadn't, we had no bullets. Um, it was a loaned rifle, loaned ammo. We, we didn't have anything else. Uh, so she was down. Uh, she was moving her head slightly. Um, we knew she was still alive, but she was down enough to where we could turn our attention to the dogs, start unhitching them and, um, tethering them to their posts so that they were safe and so that we weren't wrestling with eight powerhouse dogs you know in the presence you know of you know this you know beautiful monster you know uh so uh it was uh then we came down off the mountain i called the game warden the moment we got down off the mountain to megan's house and it took the warden about an hour to get there and uh when he came it took three more rounds um from his firearm um, at point blank range uh, for her to terminate. These are just such uh, impressively strong, tough, um, yeah. tough beasts. I mean, they're, they're amazing. They really are. And how long did it take for the, for the warden service to show up? Um, was that quick or, or did that take a while? No. It, um, so we called uh, the state police who does dispatch for the wardens. And then about 15 minutes later, I got a phone call from the warden. And then it was about 45 minutes after that before he got there. And then we both had to snowmobile up, back up on the land. He wanted to um, verify that our story lined up with the tracks, the prints, you know, everything that was on the ground. And, um, you know, he said everything lines up exactly with what how you described things went down. And so the warden service issued us a, a, a permit to harvest the meat. Uh, which was great. You know, we, we, uh, it was sad, you know, we saw fury in her eyes, but we also saw fear in her eyes too. And we, we talked about that a lot. We could see fear in her eyes as well. And we felt bad for her the entire time, but she had 45 minutes, you know, to leave the dog yard and, and didn't, but, um, you know, we're believers. So a after he gave us the, the permit, we went up there and we prayed and thanked God for her life and, um, you know, honored her life that way. Um, and then, you know, we, you know, promised her and the Lord that, you know, we were going to, you know, put the meat to good use and, and not let it go to waste. And I, and I saw you mentioned um, that this was not the first time that um, she had been to your kennel. You, you said this has happened uh, about a half dozen times. Is that true? We've seen her on uh, our 50 acres at least half a dozen times this winter. A lot, and that's another, a lot of people are saying, oh, oh this poor mother moose has got a calf somewhere. Well, first of all, the calf in the spring. So if she had a baby, it'd be a yearling by now. Every time we saw her this year, she did not have um, a yearling with her. And thankfully, um, when we field dressed her, she wasn't pregnant either. So we were actually really grateful for that. We were hoping that, you know, we wouldn't see a calf and we didn't. So that was good. And um, you said you no longer carry um, or, or you, you had kind of gotten out of the practice of carrying, but um, you'll be carrying from now on. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the people who love uh, mushing and follow the sport know that Susan Butcher, who won the Iditarod four times back in the 90s, uh, she would have won it five times. But the first time that she was ahead and, and winning, um, she, you know, she had always made fun of the men mushers for carrying firearms. And her, her team got attacked by a moose and was decimating her team. And she had to scratch. I mean, her uh, she had dogs, I think, that were killed, but definitely dogs that were severely injured. And then a fellow musher came up behind her with a firearm and dispatched the moose that was attacking her team. So, um, you know, Gary Paulson, the children's book author, uh, his team got attacked by a moose and he wrote about that. So I'd read stories about it, but I've been mushing for over 20 years and never had any, whenever I see a moose, it, I see, you know, the tail end of the moose as it's scurrying off into the woods. That's the only experience that I ever have with moose. So um, this was a unique situation. Unfortunately, I, I feel like it had to end the way that it did um, for the moose. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we will definitely um, pick up the practice of, of carrying from here on out. 
And you may have touched on this already, but has the warden service or, or based just on your experience or your knowledge given you any sense of what might have caused a moose to do this? You mentioned the straw inside the kennel. If it was hungry, it might have. Is there yeah. any other um, theories? Yeah, um, well, they didn't. I, I um, actually, um, I, I, I'm a biology teacher and I've done graduate work with the state of Maine on uh, deer winter survivability, moose winter survivability. Um, so while I'm not an avid hunter, um, I am an avid uh, uh, wildlife biologist uh, passion. That's my passion. And um, yeah, th those are the theories. Uh, winter ticks are really bad right now. The, the warden and I were pleased to see that she had still as thick a coat as she did um, with, you know, the winter tick situation being what it is in the state of Maine right now. Um, a lot of the moose have what we call uh, that they're ghost moose because they've rubbed all their guard hairs off because of ticks. She still had a good coat, um, which was, which was reassuring. Um, you know, uh, she, she had, you know, bellies full of food. Um, and so, um, really, I really think, uh, she knew better, you know, from her, from her instinct, she did not want to leave that hard pack. She felt like that was her best place to, to stand and fight rather than going off into the deep crusted snow and becoming vulnerable. And again, also her instinct, a moose, you know, they are extremely tough, but they're not the smartest tool. They're not the sharpest tools in the shed. And to her, I'm sure there was no difference between that team of dogs and a pack of wolves. Um, and uh, so I, I for, so, for whatever reason, I, I feel like she just felt like she needed to stand her ground and fight. Um, rather, you know, she had 45 minutes to leave and, and she never left. And, and Caleb, has what has it been like for this to happen so close to um, the, your first time doing the 100 um, Can-Am race? Uh, is this, do you think this is affecting your focus? Um, are you concerned about the dogs or um, you just got to kind of move on? And, and, and so what, what, what's your mindset? Where's your head at right now? Hmm. Uh... Well, uh, there's a lot of attention, and I, I'm not much of an, uh, I mean, like, I, with my family, I mean, they'll all say I love attention, right? I mean, like, they, I mean, but that's my family. I'm, like, I'm really good around them, but when it comes to, like, people, like, from school and stuff, um, <laughs> I'm, you know, like, uh, it's really awkward for me, so, uh, but, you know, like, I'm, I'm up in Fort Kent. And when it comes to the race, I can't be letting it get to my head or the opposite of that, you know, like, I can't, like, I just need to be, like, headstrong with this, focus on the race, because if everything's okay, then everything's on track, and that means I can get stuff done. And my mindset is just, you know, like, if it's all, all right, I'm going to continue. I mean, like, I'm not going to, you know, like, it runs in my family that we're not quitters, so. And you'll be running with a um, how many dog team um, this weekend? Ten. Ten. And you'll bring a couple extra dogs in case um, one of them uh, has an issue during vet checks. Is that is that right? Yeah, we actually, you can't um, substitute dogs. Uh, and we, we have a very small kennel. Um it's difficult with a, a small purebred kennel like ours. We only have 10 adult dogs. We're competing against teams that have, you know, 30, 40 dogs in their dog yard that they're selecting their best 10 from. Um, but, uh, you know, we, 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 we do the best we can with what we have. And what's your advice for, for other mushers um, out there? Um, if, if, to, to be prepared, um, is there any advice other than to, to carry a gun? Is, is there anything else um, you can you can suggest? Go ahead. Oh, me? <laughs> oh, um, um, uh, that, you know, like, no. Nope. Nope. Um, while, while he's thinking, I'll just say that um, – uh, Lev Svarts, who's a Ukrainian 
um, who moved to America um, in his childhood is an Iditarod competitor. And the moment the story broke, uh, I got a um, private message from him and it simply said, that will teach you uh, not to mush without a firearm. And uh, he, he's absolutely right. And I, you know, um, carry, but don't, but don't be quick, you know, don't be trigger happy either. Um, most of the time and most of the stories of these moose incidents, the moose is scared and he, he wants away from your team as bad as uh, as bad as you want the moose to be away from your team, usually. And so usually it's a quick stomp through your team and, and they're gone. Um, this is a unique situation where she just kept coming back and kept coming back um, and uh, just, you know, refused to leave. So, um, but hopefully, you know, carry, but ho hopefully you'll never have to use it. And even if you see a moose, you know, uh, have your hand on it, but don't be so quick because usually, you know, they, they just want to get away. Yeah. And Jonathan, you completed your own expedition across Maine. Um, did you, did, did you have any wildlife encounters, anything that spooked you or even, uh, or anything close to this? No, I, in 20 plus years of mushing, I've never had anything like this happen to me. Um, I, we see wildlife a lot. And I, I did, I did um, an expedition um, across the North Main Woods and ended up being over 280 miles, um, seven days uh, out in the North Main Woods. And it was great. I mean, I saw some moose um, from a distance and, you know, they wanted to stay away from us and we wanted to stay away from them. Saw some coyotes, some fox, um, you know, broad wing hawks, things like that. But usually it's like a wildlife safari, you know, you're out on the dog sled team, it runs silent. Um, unlike a snowmobile. So oftentimes the wildlife doesn't know you're there until you're right up on top of them, um, which can be bad, you know, when, when you're dealing with uh, rugged moose. It definitely seemed like it was helpful that you were, um, when you guys were coming into the kennel before you came across the moose, that you were on a snowmobile uh, ahead of Caleb. Um, is that standard practice or is that just because you were out at night or well, um, we have road intersections, and um, so what I do is I, what I call provide security for him at the road intersections. I'll go ahead on a snowmobile, and I'll watch for traffic and wave him through the intersections. Not really there for moose safety, um, mostly there just to, uh, you know, I let other snowmobilers know that there's a dog team ahead, and, um, you know, 99% of the time, the snowmobilers are glad to see a dog sled team on the trail, stop, take pictures, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, that, that's really why I was out. I wasn't really out for moose security. Um, and actually, um, after I warned him that there may be a moose in the dog yard, he entered the dog yard with the team before I did because his team had passed me uh, as we were talking. So um, he was in the dog yard for a couple of minutes before I got there with the snowmobile, but I wedged the snowmobile between the team and the moose just revving the engine and hoping the light and the sound of the engine and everything would scare it away, but it, it just made it more mad. Wow. It's an incredible story. Um, and uh, is, is there anything else you guys wanted to say or, or anything 